So we have seen that there are conditional probabilities that we can use to try and determine what would be the best detection strategy. We're looking at assuming that we have a linear receiver, we have a filter, we have a sample. After that, we have a detection process. And now we're focusing on that detection process. What would be a good detection strategy? We're looking for a strategy, and we've seen that um, probability density functions, conditional probability density functions, are going to be uh, very useful for us to make an informed decision. And when we use conditional probability functions, we're going to be using Bayes' law, which is a way of manipulating conditional probabilities. And in particular, we're going to use this to help us come up with decision rules. I say I'm going to take the test statistic, I'm going to compare it with the threshold. What threshold? What threshold should I be using? Well, it depends on which strategy I want to use. And we'll be looking at two particular strategies. One's called the MAP strategy, or maximum a posteriori probability. The actual one is called the ML, or the maximum likelihood uh, strategy. So both interesting uh, in different circumstances, and that's what we're going to be looking at now. So let's recall Bayes' law from our study of probability theory. If there are two events, event A and event B, uh, Bayes' law tells us that the probability of event B times the probability of event A conditioned on uh, event B is simply e equal to the probability of event B given A times the probability of event A. So that's Bayes' law. Now we're going to apply Bayes' law to our communication system. So what did I say I was interested in? This is the density, the conditional density of the test statistic, assuming that something specific happened. Now this, this is what I want to use in order to make a decision. If I want to make a decision, I want to say, well, I observed this test statistic. Is the probability greater that it was a zero cent, or is the probability greater that a one was sent? And depending on what that is, you know, I'm going to make choose either zero or one. So, you know, we're sort of interested in this. We, we, we have this. We know, we know what that density is. And so now we have to come up with how can we use Bayes' law, which applied to ours, is, is, is represented here. Uh, we can just, um, you know, make the application that, uh, you know, A is S1, let's, uh, let's I, uh, given Z, and this is um, like a Z, and, uh, you know, this is the Z given SI, and this is the SI. And then, you know, I just reordered Bayes' law so that I could isolate the one that I'm interested in. I'm interested in this one. This one I have, but I'm interested in this one. So let's look at one of these terms. I'm going to take a look, a deep dive into this term and see what that means. Well, Bayes' law is using this term PS of I, which is what we call the a priori information. A priori is the information available before we even use our communication system. Nothing to do with the actual transmission from point X to point Y. Instead, it's just the nature of the data. So SI is the probability that SI is sent. So if I have binary system, it would be the probability that a zero will be sent versus the probability that a one will be sent. So we can think of zero and one as being um, appearing with some frequency. For instance, suppose that I'm talking about a language. If I'm talking about um, the English language, there are certain letters that just don't appear very often. And so they would be less probable, and so their a priori probability would be less. The vowels occur more frequently than consonants. So um, it would be normal that you know, they're not necessarily equal probability. And so this is information that would be uh, very uh, important for us to exploit if we had this information. So does it not depend on the transmission or reception? It's just a feature of the data. Of course, sometimes it's not always known. For instance, I want to design a communication system that works for all kinds of data and not for certain statistics for the probability of the data ahead of time. So when it's available, when we can exploit it, it's very useful information but it's not always available. Next I'm going to talk about a little bit of language and that's called the a posteriori probability uh, because here I called it a priori before I started and a posteriori after I'm done. So after I actually transmit this um, uh, symbol 
uh, what is the probability given uh, that z is measured? So now uh, I'm giving a, a language, a vocabulary, to this density uh, that were this probability and the probability density that we were interested in. What is the probability of this symbol after I have transmitted through a communication system, after I have information about the, um, the test statistic? So maybe the zero is twice as likely to be sent as the one, maybe, but when I receive it, now what is the probability? Okay, so this is the a posteriori probability, and it's been affected by the communication system. So it, in, it is a direct function of our receiver. It's not independent of the receiver. It's going to be a function of that, that um, um, filter I chose, etc. So now that we've looked at some vocabulary, I'm going to give some specific names to the quantities that we're looking at. First of all, I said that this is the a priori probability. Next, I'm going to call this the a posteriori uh, probability. And the last one, we're going to call the likelihood function. Uh, so we have the likelihood function tells me how likely uh, certain values of uh, z uh, are going to be. So vocabulary, a posteriori, a priori, and here we have the likelihood function. And remember, it's the likelihood function which is easy to write the density for. Here we have the, the Gaussian density. So I said there were two types of rules that we could use. One was to maximize the a posteriori probability, and we call that a map function. So that would be one strategy, which might be a very, very good strategy. <laughs> a receiver that chooses the data that maximizes the, the data, the estimate of the data, that maximizes the probability of an, of a, an observation. So if I were going to write that um, in more mathematical language, I would say choose SI, and it's either choose 0 or choose 1, that index, choose 0, choose 1, such that this a posteriori probability is maximized. Um, if I were using uh, only mathematical uh, notation, I would say SI such that it the, the maximizes over all the index J of this conditional probability. Um, so if I choose I, then I will be the maximum of these two. Uh, this is a language which we can be generalized to the non-binary case as well. Uh, but for the binary case, it would be easier to say if uh, PS0 is bigger, use that, choose 0. If PS1 is bigger, condition on Z, um, choose the 1. So let's try to figure out, I, I, you know, eventually I said that my receiver is to compare Z with a threshold. <laughs> so how do I get from this idea of Bayes' uh, law and um, this equation that describes the conditional probabilities, the likelihood function, the a priori and the a posteriori probabilities. How do we take that and turn it into compare with its threshold? That's what we're going to do now is the method that gets us there. So let's look at some equivalents. I said I want to find the j, which one of these j's, if j can be 0 or 1, is it 0 or 1, that max that is bigger. And of course, if this one's bigger, that means but this side of the equation has to be bigger. So if I look at this side of the equation, I'm going to be putting in a certain value of j here, and I'm going to see which one is bigger. Well, the denominator doesn't have an index j, so it's not going to change the comparison. So if I'm going to look at this product with uh, j equals 0 or this product with j over 1, the denominator isn't going to change it. So I can get rid of that in the maximization. So what I'm really trying to do is maximize this product. Is this product bigger uh, when I have j equals 0 or is it bigger when I have j equals 1? Okay. So we can see the importance of the a priori probability in the map receiver because it is directly multiplying this likelihood function. So the probability a priori is side information. It's, it's insight that we have based on what our knowledge of what the data is like. So if I know the 0 is much more likely than the 1, well then I kind of like to push my decision towards the 0. 
uh, and not in all cases, but in some cases. So we can think of this as being like a weight, a weight that's multiplying by this conditional probability. So the larger this a priori probability is, it's going to force this product to be uh, more likely to be the larger one. But again, I say that um, that is not always known. So the map receiver, if the a priori probability is known, it uses it, and it's a weighting that's given to the likelihood function. So this is the likelihood function that we've written here, and the a priori weights that likelihood function. Now, the second possibility I said is the maximum likelihood receiver. And the maximum likelihood receiver is one that does not use the a priori probability, because if it's not available, for instance. In this case, I don't use Bayes' law. I said, I'm just going to maximize the likelihood function. So and now I'm not using Bayes' law. I'm just taking the likelihood function, and I'm saying, choose whichever index maximizes the likelihood. So I have a certain probability for this uh, test statistic that I observed, a very large number. Z, Z is a very large number. So is it more probable that I would get a large number if 0 was sent? Or is it more probable that I would get a large number if 1 was sent? So I'm just using that information. I'm not weighting it with any uh, information about which of the 0 or the 1 would be more probable. So there's something that's kind of interesting, and that is, when do these two strategies end up giving you the same result? And so, like I said, maximum likelihood is especially interesting when we don't have the a priori probability. But when they are equal is when the a priori probability isn't very helpful. It's helpful, a priori probability is helpful when there's a big disparity between the probability of different symbols. But suppose that all symbols were equally probable. In the binary case, that would mean that the 0 is just as likely as the 1. They each have 1 half probability. Well, if they're each the same, then my weighting doesn't do anything, because <laughs> everything is weighted by the same number. So the map and the ML are actually equivalent, completely identical, in the case of uh, equal priors, we call that, or identically distributed uh, symbols, a priori symbols. And uh, if I have m symbols, that would mean each of the probabilities was m in binary case, m equal 2, probability of 1, probability of 0 would be 1 half.